we made it to the end. <laughs> last, last set of slides. All right. So what we're going to talk about in this section, we're going to talk about adornments. Um, I have a really cool story about Hera, the queen of the goddesses. Um, and then we're going to just wrap it up with a uh, ceremonial dress. So we'll talk about Greek, ancient Greek weddings and the legacy of Greek dress. We've seen what they worn, and now let, let's talk about the adornments, right? So um, at the beginning of this lecture, we talked about, you know, them wearing their hair in in curls. And oftentimes when we see uh, class, when we see Greek men, they have these very stylized, stylized beards. Um, but in the more classical, classical era, they they pretty much men pretty much wore their hair, their hair short. Um, it does seem from the artistic depictions that we have that all Greeks had curls, <laughs> curly hair, whether it was natural curl or it was how they manipulated, how they manipulated their hair is, is unknown. Um, so the images that we have here on, on the right are typical depictions of, of men and women in, in their, in their hairstyles. And, you know, women, for the most part, wore their hair in you know long tresses with some kind of arrangement of curls around their face. Um, you know, this is kind of a cross section of hairstyles um, from across time, but they did use adornments in their hair. So they used um, you know ribbons and scarves and caps um, to confine their hair. Sometimes they wore um, veils that oftentimes we, we would see pulled across their face. You see that depiction on the very end. She's wearing some type of tiara. So, you know, dressing of the hair was was important. In terms of footwear, for the most part, everybody wore sandals. It's a hot, dry, dry climate. Um, sometimes men wore uh, ankle high or mid calf fitted shoes and uh, and they pre predominantly wore that. For travel um, and when in warfare, right? We talked about a war in the last slide. They they wore some type of leather boot that laced up laced up the front. Women in general just wore wore sandals. Um, there was some minimal jewelry that were worn um, by more often women than men, and it consisted of necklaces and earrings and decorative pins. We talked about those pins <laughs> for fat for fastening dresses. Um, there's not much actual um, evidence of the use of cosmetics we we can surmise based on their relationship with Egyptians and and how they borrowed from Egyptian culture and styling that they may have used um, you know may have used some makeup but there's no writings that that prove that however writings of the period do talk about talk about perfumes and that's the that's the last story that I'm going to tell uh, again we're going back to to um to uh, we're going to talk about homer he is one of the great poets of the time his books the iliad and the odyssey are still read today in a lot of philosophy philosophy classes and they describe not only some of the clothing that's worn by women but they also talk a little bit about about jewelry so the story i'm going to tell in the next slide is about the goddess hera Last, last story, and I don't want to say funny story, just interesting story. So uh, this story is about the the goddess Hera, and Hera is the queen of the gods. Um, she is, if you know anything about Greek mythology, she is the wife and sister of Zeus. <laughs> That's a whole other story. There was a lot of incestuous relationships in the Olympian, in the Greek god pantheon. Um, but she is known for being the goddess of marriage and birth. And despite being the goddess of marriage and birth and being married to Zeus, she was known to be jealous, <laughs> like super jealous and vengeful, really vengeful towards the many lovers and offsprings of, of Zeus. And the, first, the very first picture that we looked at at the beginning was of um, what we now know as Aquarius. And there's a whole... You got to go read the story of <laughs> Zeus and Aquarius and Hera. Hera was no, she was a hater of her husband's mistresses and people, lovers, because he, he had both male and female lovers. So, um, so she was known to be 
jealous. So in the Iliad, which is a book that was written by uh, by Homer, um, he describes how um, Hera, the goddess, beautifies herself so that she um, is going to persuade her husband, the god Zeus, to do something that she wants him to do. So she was getting herself fly in order to get Zeus, get in order to get Zeus to do what she wanted him to do. So here's a story. This is actually a quote out of the out of the Iliad. So it says she went to her bedchamber and there she drew shut the leaves of the shining door uh, and washed her adorable body, washed away all the stains of the day. She washed with ambrosia, a sweet smelling substance, and next anointed herself with ambrosia sweet olive oil, which stood there in its fragrance beside. So that just means it was a perfume. Um, when with this she had anointed her delicate body and combed her hair she arranged the shiny and lovely ambrosia curls so she hooked up her wig she got her hair together on her immortal head and dressed in an ambrosial robe that athena another goddess had given had made for her because we talked about how athena was the first person to cultivate wool and make that fabric she um, let me see where are we where am i um she adorned herself with the dress that Athena made her um, and pinned it across her breast with a golden brooch and circled her, wa her waist with a belt that, flo that floated a hundred tassels. So basically she was still allowed to wear a, a, a piece of jewelry decoration on her garment and she adorned herself as well with a, with a, with a belt. And in the lobes of her carefully pierced ear, she put rings with triple dots of mulberry clusters. So basically she had on some earrings um, that were made of mulberry, which is a which is a, a berry. Um, radiant with beauty and lovely among goddesses, she veiled her head downward with a sweet, fresh veil that glimmered like pale sunlight. Underneath her shining feet, she bound on, she bound on fair sandals and this is in again in the Iliad book 14 in the Iliad is a poem so it's lines 169 to 186 so Homer just laid it out for us <laughs> what Hera did to get dressed what she do she took a bath she put on some smell good stuff she put out her best outfit she got her hair together she put on her jewelry right and got her her finest shoes uh, on so um, I just I love that story because it's such a vivid depiction of what a goddess needed to do to get her man, to, her cheating man, <laughs> to get her cheating man to do something that she wanted him to do. So um, I, I love that story. I hope you at least like it if you don't love it, too. I just find it comical. So. All right. So we have uh, we're going to finish up. Do a couple more slides. We're going to finish up next. We're going to talk about um, some ceremonial dress um, for um, for Greeks because we have some de some depictions of what ceremonial specifically what wedding dresses look like. The last thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about ceremonial dress. And when we talked about uh, in the first. Uh, in the first lecture, we talked about the different types of dress and modes of dress. So we're going to talk about some ceremonial dress and specifically we're going to talk about a wedding dress because we have a depiction of a wedding garment. And so the garment that we see on the side is um, is laden with symbolism, right? The wedding garment um, in in this in this vase had some areas that were dyed purple. Um, that was very costly and it's a, a dye that's obtained um, from a really rare type of mollusk oyster basically um, so it's an ink it's an ink that is obtained from the sea creature that is then used as as a as a dye and the bride wore a belt that was tied with a double knot and that that double knot is known as a Hercules knot and the loosening of this knot was symbolic because it took place on the wedding night and it's, um, you know, a symbol <laughs> and a preference of what is about to go down with the bride and the groom. Right. So being able to undo that knot was was important. And, you know, her veil was um, oftentimes pulled up uh, over the back of their he her head and it was colored a yellow orange from 
the saffron plant and saffron was um, often is often often symbolic because it was associated um, because it was a medicinal um, it was used as a medicinal purpose for women that were having um, having female problems that were having menstrual problems so um, so it had some symbolism too and you know the veil covered the bride's face and during the ceremony it was um, lifted to reveal the bride sounds familiar right but you have to keep in mind that in this time period marriages were arranged so oftentimes this is the first time that the groom and the bride will ever see each other and um, you know the unveiling um, that part of the ceremony was thought to have symbolized the bride's willingness to be accepted to accept this arrange arrange marriage right upon the conclusion of the bridal ceremony both the bride and groom also were crowned with laurel wreaths which is a religious symbol that has association um, association with weddings of both mortals and immortals and if we think about the crowning of laurel leaves off also happens um, for the winners of the Olympic Games which have a background in Greek and Greek mythology um, in addition the bride did wear um, you know she wore a special kind type of sandals and this is a time where she would have potentially worn some elaborate jewelry and then finally uh, the bride actually would present the groom with a tunic that she had that she had woven herself that she had made herself and this gift symbolizes her mastery of you know the essential skills of being a housewife right of being um, being a good choice right we talked about how, how women in the in this time period had to do everything for the house and weaving of cloth and and um, you know cultivating you know, uh, animal husbandry so keeping of the sheep and growing up the crops those were all things that were wifely duties so by presenting her best work because that's what she would present the best possible tunic that she could make to her bride show that mastery of that essential skill in the period this is the legacy of a Greek dress right and you know the the style <laughs> of the chitin or, or the peplos or you know of the 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 hematon or the the toga right it didn't change it didn't change with the, with the decline of Greek power right the spread of Greek settlements and culture throughout the Mediterranean world and the adoption of Greek elements um, you know by or the sharing of Greek elements you know from uh, Egyptians to uh, those that traded on the Silk Road is evident and Greek dress can said to have served a basic basis for what well, we're going to the next civilization we're going to talk about um, you know Rome and more importantly Romani, uh, Romanized Europe so for the six centuries that followed the death of Alexander the Great that Greco-Roman those are the words that historians use that Greco-Roman influence continued and it can even be argued that influence influences of, of that dress can be felt until the later part of, part of the Middle Ages and when we get to the Middle Ages we'll talk about the influence of the Greeks and you know moreover Greek influence on dress dress was just not um, limited to the civilizations that coexisted with classical Greeks classical Greeks if we look at, um, at at current times right at contemporary times it's it's still influence and the dress that we have here is a Monique you know Lillier dress and it's uh, made of a gold foil twill and it's one shoulder with a knotted waist and a high slit uh, and it is a Greek garment right it all for all intents and purposes it is a Greek a Greek garment and you know the white wedding dress the, the dress that we saw in the in the last image now I'm not gonna say that white wedding dresses people haven't always worn white for for weddings there was a period in time where we didn't wear white but how that influence does some of that influence does come from ancient Greece in the dresses that are seen on these beautiful statues that I've shown you with with all of the draping so 
Um, the influence of Greeks has continued today, and the, the the belting method that they that they use. And when we think about the images that we saw earlier, that belting method that we use, which is the belting of the dress high under the bust line, was you know copied from Hellenistic styles, and now we call that an empire waist. <laughs> this is from the Greek Empire. You know that style has been revived over and over and fashion designers of the 20th and 21st century um, definitely has have looked to Greek styles as inspiration and especially when we think of um, you know designers of evening dresses we do still see the legacy of Greek dress so we are at the end of uh, the end of the actually of this part of the lecture on Greek dress and next, we will be moving on to the Romans.